One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yes, yes, yes. It's the Raphael Dawkins with the Combat Radio. And today, we're uh, it's interview day. It's Thursday. It's Thursday, the 2nd of June. And uh, first things first, am I, am I camera ready? Am I camera ready? Okay, not quite. <laughs> okay, so let's, what am I looking for? Let me do a sound check. First things first, let's do the sound check. Okay, there we are. Didn't appear for a moment. I was a little bit worried. Let's listen. Am I camera ready? Am I camera ready? Okay. So there we go. We are alive. It's Raphael Dawkins. It's the Combat Radio. And uh, it's the Thursday live interview. Live interviews on Thursday. We've been doing them for a few weeks now. And uh, this week is no different. Let's just line this up. Let's line this up nicely. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Let's get that. Let's get that up. Let's get the let's get the writing up. Let's tell you who we have for you today. Surprise guest. Um Okay, there you have it. Calvin Brook, live in the building. And uh, let's check my camera again. Let's check the camera angles. Let's check the camera angles. Okay, let's get this thing up. Let's get this thing up on my device so I can keep tabs. Keep tabs on what's going on out there in the YouTube, on the YouTube channel. Okay, let's kill the volume on that. Okay, okay, everything's situated nicely. And um, on the second device, let's get it up on there too. Let's make sure everything is in simpatico, volume low, don't want no interference. And uh, boom, 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 there it is. Okay, so where are we? Where's the, where's the artwork? Let me show you the artwork. Let me show you the artwork only done literally a few minutes before we went live. Um, quite proud of it. Quite proud of it. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. There he is. There's a reminder that, ladies and gentlemen, is Calvin Brook. Or is it Brock? Um, there's only one way to find out. There's only one way to find out the correct pronunciation, and uh, here he is himself, <laughs> the man himself. Is it Brook or Brock? Brock. 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 Get it right, folks. Brock. Um, Calvin Brock up live up in the building all the way from sunny North Carolina. Calvin Brock, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show today. Hey, it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Where are we? We got some comments coming in already. <laughs> uh, what can I say to that? What can I say to that? Yes. You have fans. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. So um, there we have it. There we have it. Uh, let's get into Let's get into the thing. So, Calvin Brock, who is who is Calvin Brock for those for those who weren't watching you back back in your heyday? Well, Calvin Brock was the number one world ranked contender that challenged for the heavyweight championship of the world against Vladimir Klitschko in November of two thousand and six, and also competed in the two thousand Sydney Australia Olympics. So I also had the 2006 knockout of the year mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. And, um, you know, I still have a lot of fans. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, as a matter of fact, rat -a -tat -tat, where are we? Um, I think I've got some of the... I think I got some of the artwork. Let me just flash up some of the artwork for the people just coming in. Let me just flash that up real quick, uh, so people can see. People can see you in there. I like this picture. I like this picture of you in there with Vladimir. He's all the whole of his right side. The right. whole of his right side is bruised up. You must have been catching him. That's his left side. You must have been catching him with some hooks to the body, and you blooded his left eye. He was putting. He was putting some work in on Klitschko. Oh yeah, I was pretty working on it. Uh, I think I just those middle rounds can be tough in any boxer match. You ask any boxer, mm -hmm. uh, when the middle rounds is when you get the tiredest, and then you catch a second win. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, everyone knows that Vladimir over his almost ten year reign as heavyweight champion. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really didn't tire out. Um, he kind of stays strong from round one through round 12, and which is kind of unusual for most, most <laughs> boxers. Yeah, so most boxers would get tired with you in the middle rounds. Yeah. And the fight ends up on the inside, and I was a great inside boxer, but I could never really get on the inside of him. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't you get in the inside of, Klitsch, of, of, of uh, Klitschko? Why couldn't you get on the inside? Same reason why nobody got on the inside of him. He had great movement, great jab, and he was extremely strong. And once you get on the inside of him, the way he threw his jab, he would just pull you in, and then you, you know how you locked into a clinch. The mm. referee breaks you up, and then he's putting his weight on you and everything. So it was kind of hard to get on the inside of him and really go to work. So if you look at all of his opponents, nobody was able to get on the inside and go to work on him. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what was that, the footwork and – the foot, he was just. He, I guess he knew. I guess he knew how to keep keep distance. I guess he he knew, yeah, I mean, keeping distance and working that jab and his height, along with his strength and the way that he used his weight on, on top of you once you got on, got inside of his reach. Uh, he was excellent, probably the best ever at you know maintaining that distance and not allowing someone to work on the inside of him. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 So that was uh that was you and that was you and big Vladimir Klitschko. Um but that we jumped the story, we jumped the story. We're gonna come back, we're gonna come back to that later. Um first things first, let's take take it take it from the beginning, take it from the beginning. Calvin Brock, why did Calvin Brock end up in the gym and what happened when you got there? Well, Calvin Brock first, like the, uh, you know, I think I gave him like the Christ around six years old. And then sometime around between the age of six and eight, I asked God what he wanted me to do with my life and everything. And then I was given a set of boxing gloves for a Christmas present when I was eight years old, uh, two sets of gloves. And I started boxing with my neighborhood friends. And then around the age of 10, that's when that's when God put it, uh, put the dream in my heart that this is what I wanted to do with my early, with my youthful self. And, uh, and so I went to the Boston gym in June of 2000 and, uh, you know, June of 1987. I was 12 years old and, you know, it got started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what year was that, sorry? What year was that? 1987, June of 1987. I had just finished up elementary school, graduated from the sixth grade, and, and I went in and got started at age 12. Excellent. By the age of 12. So you tell me about your first boxing gym, your, your, your experience in the first boxing gym. Yeah. Well, my first trainer was seven, nine years old. He was just way past his prime of putting a lot of putting anything into anyone. So I lost my first four boxing matches. Then my dad took me to another gym across. Hold, town. On, hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. So your first four boxing matches under this underneath the 79 year old trainer, you lost them. The first four. First four. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Didn't you get discouraged? Didn't you get discouraged? Well, I lost my first six, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you oh know what? Good. I didn't get to get discouraged. You know, the truth is it was a big uh, it was a big improvement from my first match. I mean uh, uh to my second match. My second match, I actually won it. And I actually won my third match, but at that time, in the state of North Carolina, they just weren't giving fair. You know, the judging wasn't wasn't fair. So, 
And I think they hurt my confidence a lot. Then my fourth boxing match I lost. Then my fifth boxing match, I, you know, I improved a whole lot, but still lost. Then my sixth boxing match I lost. And I had my first win, my seventh boxing match. And then I started winning a lot. Wow. Wow. But hold on a second. Hold on a second. Because somebody losing so many matches earlier on, that would discourage that would discourage the average person. They just pack up, pack up, maybe after three. Maybe after three, they throw the gloves in the garbage, as you call it over there. We call it the rubbish. Um, they throw the, the gloves in the rubbish bin and, and walk away and never look back. That's most people, but, um, you know, I guess God gave me what it takes. I really had a lot of faith and confidence that I would, you know, become good. And, and I just kept kept going. I mean, I think that's kind of my makeup and personality and everything I put my heart to. I mean, that's where it is. That's the reason why I've been married for almost 15, well, 15 years this month I've been married. Uh, that's the reason why I'm still working at my businesses. I just don't, I just have that consistency kind of spirit that once I put my mind to something, I just keep, keep going. I, yeah. Until it comes to fruition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Keep on going until, until you've accomplished You've accomplished the goal, uh, right. one, one way or the other. Okay, so so you're now. Who's training you now? Who's training you now? Because the first boxing gym, the guy was 79. The second boxing gym, what happened at the sec second boxing gym? I went to the second boxing gym and the trainer quit after two months of being over there. Dang. Oh, so that left no one other other than my dad. So my dad stepped in and started coaching me, and he had never boxed before either. So here we are, two people. They don't know anything about boxing, so he ordered <laughs> boxing video tapes. And that's how we learn from boxing instructional video tapes, man. And uh, I think that's um, very uncharacteristic to, you know, to go as high as I went in boxing yeah. just from instructional video tapes. So how long was your dad who didn't box himself, uh, didn't know how to – well, you know, was, wasn't, wasn't a boxer as such. Uh, how, how long were you training under your father? I trained underneath my dad all the way up until uh, until I turned professional in 2001. So he was my amateur trainer for 13 years. And, uh, well, for 12 years. So it was about 12 or 13, about 12 years. And then I turned professional and started getting other trainers. And then I ended up with a trainer out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Tom Yankello. And that pretty much is the trainer that, that, that kind of like really – sounded my fundamentals mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um hold on let me ask anybody in the chat have you received a notification have you received a notification um i, I don't know i can't remember did i receive <laughs> did i receive a notification i can't remember if i actually received the notification um let me see if anybody in the chat received the notification. Let me see if anybody in the chat received a notification. Not getting any response. Not getting any response. Okay, I don't know if, if the YouTube, I don't know if everybody, I don't know if all my subscribers have been notified yet. If anybody in the chat received the notification, let me know. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so... We'll carry on as we move on. Okay, so let's get this clear. Your father, who had never boxed himself, what didn't really know boxing, trained you through your whole amateur career, which lasted for 12, 13 years. That's correct. Wow. That's correct. Yes. Wow. 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 That's incredible. That's incredible. And let's get this straight. Under your father's tutelage, you got to the Olympics. That's correct. <laughs> that's crazy that's that's, yeah. that's 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 on her that's that's yeah. amazing to me that's amazing I won, all the, I won all the national championships and ended up going to the olympics so i'm just underneath my father's tutelage yep wow 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 that's 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 incredible that's incredible do you, do you know what the disappointing thing is it's 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 like there are so many coaches out there that don't that do not really know how to teach the fundamental of boxing, the fundamental, the sweet science, because they they've never learned it themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So it, I really wasn't all that much at a disadvantage because there's so many coaches that that really didn't know how to train, didn't know boxing themselves, and they may have been boxers, but they were never taught correctly themselves. Mm. So, so uh, you know, that uh, that disadvantage wasn't too wide, to be quite honest with you. Hmm. Hmm. Even even today, it's hard to find a trainer that really knows the fundamental sweet signs of box. Damn, damn. So, so to be clear, to be clear, um, the most valuable thing you think one of the most valuable things is to basically have a coach who knows the basic fundamentals. Because right. It hmm. takes a coach that knows how to teach the fundamentals and the strategy behind it, and if a boxer is willing to work hard, a trainer can make a a great trainer can make a champion out of anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learning the fundamentals, getting taught the right fundamentals, and yeah, it probably worked to your benefit that you was with a coach who happened to be a father who was focused on focused on the fundamentals and learning the fundamentals himself and making sure that you had the fundamentals. Well, you know what? Really, really, my dad didn't know the fundamentals. You know, he was just a coach that pretty much, you know, taught me how to, you know, we work on combinations, we work on slipping, we work on rolling. But even in all of that is a right and wrong way of throwing each and every punch, a right and wrong way how to slip and roll, block punches, the strategy behind it. And that's when Tom Yankello, my professional trainer, came in. That's when I learned those things. Uh -huh. So me with just a lot of hard work and gifted talent. And yeah. then Experience. So you have a lot of boxers that, because they're experienced, they just learn how to win with what with what they have. Yeah, yeah. But when they come up against someone that know how to win, likewise, that's fundamentally sound. Yes. And taught properly, then they come up short. You see? Yeah, yeah. They would have to. They would have to because good fundamentals will always win. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Regardless, regardless, when everything else is equal, good fundamentals. We'll take you over the top. <laughs> over the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take you over to the top. Okay. So, um, fundamentals now. So, okay, you've got to the Olympics. And um, what was that experience like? Getting there is a surreal experience because Olympics is just every four years. It's, it's so many people's dream to get there. And it's only one each way class that goes. And when I got there, it was a fun, you know, it was a bittersweet experience because I lost. And um, I think it most importantly because I lost is because uh, fundamentals. Uh, the person that I lost against was better fundamentally, you know, put together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it made the difference in the world. Along with, I, I didn't think I was trained to my peak performance because at the Olympics, it's unfortunately, on the team, they had these coaches that train everybody alike. That's from 12 different weight classes. You can't do that. You know what I'm saying? Let me train the way I know how to train. I got here when all these national championships got the Olympics because I know how to, you know, train. I don't need you to tell me how to train. I know what to do, how to train. Yeah. Boss would be better off to stay at home and train for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what did they have you doing? What did they have you doing? What should they have had you doing? Not enough sparring, too much running, uh, not enough rest, just wars out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Terrible. Terrible. Uh, did you talk to some of your fellow fellow boxers about it? Was there like huddles? Did you get in a huddle and talk about what was going wrong or did you just do what you were told and go back to the hotel? You know, most of the boxers were pretty vocal. Not, uh, not all of them, but all of them had the same consensus that, you know, the training just wasn't up to par. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, we didn't yeah. with Olympic gold medal. That was the first year in 2000 that the, U, that the U.S. team didn't win a gold medal. Now, the, now the Olympics is a lot tougher. I mean, since Andre Ward in 2004, there hasn't been a male to win an Olympic gold medal. So, you know, <laughs> it's tough, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, clearly. Clearly it's tough. Okay. So, you, you come back after the Olympics. Take it from there. Come back from the Olympics, uh, you know, Heartbroken. Mm -hmm. uh, then I, you know, I, I ended up putting, you know, getting a team put together. Then I turned pro, and I moved out to Las Vegas. My first year, I was training underneath uh, um, Andrew Pops Anderson. He just, he just, he just 
went by Pops. He trained Samuel Peters as well. I was the one who got Samuel Peters with Papa Anderson's call. Me and Samuel, we were friends, so we were like uh, trained together, spar together, and all that kind of thing. So he, he ended up picking up Pops as his trainer. I ended up leaving Pops and going with Tommy Keller out of Pittsburgh. Thought, you know, Tommy Keller was better for me. I think I needed a little bit more <laughs> at that time. So it, uh, you know, then I just went from there. And then I changed from uh, American Presents, picked me up first, and then I went from American Presents to Main Events. Um, promotion company and just kept climbing the ranks until I got it to world title shot. Excellent. 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 Kept climbing the ranks, kept climbing to the ranks. And you, you make it sound that you make it sound quick. I mean, I mean, how long were you a pro before you got the world title shot? Uh, five years. Just, uh, I turned pro in February of 2001. I fought for the title in November of 2006. So you're talking like, you know, like, Five years and ten months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Take us through those. Take us through those five years. Take us through those five years. Um, uh, the, no, the, the first year. No, the, no. The thing is, man. You know, if you don't come out with Olympic gold medal or a silver yeah. medal, you know, you get a, you know, a huge sign of bonus, and you get in great paid purses. It's tough. You literally fighting for a living. You know, I was fighting from paycheck to paycheck. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so my first the, the first year in two thousand one, I had eight matches in eight months. Wow. Yeah, it was real busy. Uh, made it. Um, Goose and Tudor, Dan Goose did a great job keeping me busy. The late Dan Goose. Um, America Presents is no longer around. You know, they kind of dissolved back in late two thousand one. And uh, then I was on a hiatus, laid out for about seven months. Then main events picked me up. Then I was fighting about every six, eight weeks, all the way up until I started fighting around like 10 rounds. Then once you get a boxing around 10 rounds, you're boxing about three or four times a year. And it stayed that way all the way up until I fought for the world title. And so main events were your promoters at that point? Yeah, they were my promoter from uh let's see 2000 from like July 2002 all the way through 2007 for like 5 years. Damn. And uh uh that was the um what was that family called again? The um Well, they were originally the Duva family. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. That's Kathy right. Duva. Yeah. Kathy Duva, Kathy Duva, and the uh, old man Duva. I've forgotten his name. Lou Duva. Yeah, Lou Duva. Lou Duva. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, where are we here? Uh, Lou Duva. So what was this question here? We've got a question come in. Uh, Calvin, did you, you you did well to beat Jamil McCline. He was far, he was a far bigger heavyweight. Yeah, you know, that Boston match, I'll be quite honest with you. A lot of people didn't including my promoter, Kathy Duver and her style. Didn't think I was going to win that Boston match. That was like a right. big come out Boston match. Uh, Jamil McCline here just controversially, controversially um, lost to Chris Bird for the world title. So he just come out of world title shot, and which I even thought he won it. And uh, yeah. then, then he boxes against me, mm -hmm. which I think he's going to have an easy time. And I go in there and I beat him. <laughs> you know, no question. It was a, one of my best boxing matches. You know, he did put me down in the seventh round, but you know that showed that I, you know I can get back up and I got a champion heart and come keep myself together and still pull the win out. Yes, well, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're pro now. You're pro now, and uh, you've had eight fights in the first round, eight fights in eight months in in your first year, something like that. And right. now you're fighting. You're fighting under the Duvers. Um, Lou Duva, Kathy Duva. How did you? How did you find them? How did? How did? How did they treat you? How did they treat you? What was your experience as a boxer on the on the uh, main events? I you know what. No complaints. They were the most honest, most transparent, probably people I ever dealt with. Uh, not to say that I dealt with a lot, mm -hmm. but uh, they really took real great care of me. Uh, just to make a short correction. Lou Duva had branched off to his own company called Duva Promotions oh. was, was ran by a son, Dino at the time, Dino Duva. Uh, it was a fallout with Kathy and the, the Duva family, so that's when Kathy kind of branched off onto her own, uh -huh. just, you know, maybe like uh, 99, 2000, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I already had a relationship with Lou Duva and Kathy Duva mm -hmm. because they, you know, they pretty much sponsored me as an amateur. Oh. 
So I was already used to traveling with them, going to their training camps and things. Hmm. And uh, they just that after I lost in the Olympics, the first match, they kind of got turned away because they couldn't take me straight to a, a HBO or Showtime deal. It was, was a business decision. So, hmm. but after you know, I, a year, you know, I'm, I was like eight and zero, I believe I was. They kind of picked me back up, and we went from there. That's so, cool, man. Yeah, that, that's cool because we hear a lot of stories of fighters who get with promotional outfits. Uh, and they get a very, very raw deal. Yeah, man. It really takes someone that uh, know how to negotiate a good contract. You know, fortunately for me, I um, also had the help of Jim Thomas. Jim Thomas was a manager for Vander Holyfield, and he got me out of the contract with American Presents, with the Goosers, and got me in with the main events. And he negotiated a great contract from the experience of dealing with Vander Holyfield all those years when Vander was world champion. And uh, so uh, then, you know, not just that, but, you know, the contract was a contract, but main events, they always was, main events treated me better than what they had written against the terms of my contract. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was just a minimum, but they did, you know, they went above and beyond and they, they really kept me happy. Wow. 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 That's a, <laughs> that's a happy tale. That's a happy tale. Um, so, a, a bit of advice then at this point of the interview, a little bit of advice to, to boxers coming up, um, <clears throat> how not to get ripped off. What, what are the steps? What are the steps that you'd recommend uh, to boxers turning from amateur to pro and not to not get ripped off? The best thing to not to get ripped off is, and this is what I did. I talked to a lot of different people. Hmm. And we also have to uh, look at, uh, different promoters contracts, you know, tell them to send you a contract, look at everybody's contract, read it for yourself. Just don't take the word of, uh, you know, if you don't understand it, get an attorney, but you know, I was a graduate, you know, college graduate. I can read my own contracts. I understand them very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they're that hard to understand, but yeah, everyone should get used to reading their own contracts, compare them and kind of like come together and take the best of all contracts and put them into one. And those are the lines that you negotiate upon. Uh, you know yeah so basically you get a number of contracts you look at the contracts you look at you figure out which ones are the best ones you figure out the features of the best contracts you figure out what a good contract looks like and if needs to be you go with the best contract and you're up you up the requirements so you have right. to compare it's like buying car insurance it's like buying car insurance you don't go with the first one necessarily you compare you right. get different quotes Right, right. Yeah, cause, you, cause you have to learn what what is norm, you know, what's yeah. normal, and, yeah, uh, what is good and what is bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course. Of course. Along those lines, but you don't if you don't get the opportunity to read a bunch of different contracts, man. You yeah. don't know anything. You gotta just just walking in the blind. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're blindfolded. You walk in yeah. blindfolded. You walk in blindfolded. That's not good. And it's shark, and you you have you're, you're in shark infested waters anyway, and then you're just blindfolding yourself. Right. So that that's not that's not that's not the best. That's not optimal at all. It's not optimal. Um. Yeah. What does Marla say? Nice to hear of a good promotional company in boxing. You hear so many bad stories. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, the Duvers, the Duvers, the the Duvers, they 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 seem. They seem like a decent square. They seem like a give you a square deal. They seem like give you a square deal. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? You know, obviously, you know, I never heard anything bad about Top Rank. Never heard anything bad about Golden Boy. Uh, those three. I never, never. I never heard anything bad about Al Heyman. Mm. Uh, so obviously, they must be treating the bosses um, pretty good. You know, keeping their word to their contracts or doing better than what their contracts. You know, going above and beyond the. Uh, the minimums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they keep on, you know, getting a world champion, the world champion, boss's son, you know, year after year. So, you know, if you don't treat people right, it will surface after a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you just mentioned Al Heyman as being one of the good guys. Um, he's a very polarizing figure. Some people love him. Some people hate him. What What's that all about? I really don't know. I never met him. I never, uh, all I'm saying is that 
he he does a good job at keeping a a roster feel of top quality boxers and continuing world champions one after another one. So for him to to uh, stay at that level, he has to be treating his boxers right. I, w- I would assume. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. So Al Heyman, uh, polarizing figure. Some people say he's terrible, but you're right. Uh, you don't really hear too many complaints from the fighters themselves. So theoretically, you must be doing something right. Right. Um, we got another question in from Marla. Um, everybody in the chat, uh, I know it's a busy night out there on the interwebs. Anybody who's not in here now, I'm sure they'll be able to catch the replay. So for sure, everybody in the chat, be sure to share the video. And um, I myself, I myself will share it on social media, all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. So make sure, make sure you share it so people get to hear. People get to hear the word. Okay, we got a question in from Marla. Uh, Calvin, you retired at 32. Do you think too many fighters stay too long? I don't see, I don't like seeing guys fight into their 40s. Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. It's like this. I don't like seeing boxers stay in the game too long if they're taking punches. Mm-hmm. So you take a guy like Floyd Mayweather, uh, Vladimir Klitschko, uh, even, like, even Mike Tyson, um, mm-hmm. uh, if you were to take a Andre Ward, some, these, these defense Great guys, yeah, yeah. They, defensively they, sound, they, defensively yeah. sound guys. Right, they don't get knocked out, not taking punches. I mean, they can have a long career; mm-hmm. they really can. But if, you, if 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 they're taking uh, punches, then they, it's best you know for them to see them come out. And and if they're no longer at the top of the sport, these these names are just named. They're always every time you see them, they in championship matches. Yep. Making millions of dollars, and neither have they been, you know. And the only way they've been able to stay at that level is by being good and being and staying winning and not taking a lot of punches. Because mm-hmm. like I said, if you're taking punches, you, you're not going to keep winning. So, with the ones that can stay into their you know, 40s, and you're seeing them on, you know, worldwide television, then yep. it's probably okay. But the ones that are not making any money in boxing, that you're not seeing on worldwide championship boxing, they need to come out. Yeah. They're messing up their lives for the rest of their life. Their <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> messing up their lives for the rest of their lives. Damn. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's poetry right there, Calvin. That's poetry right there. <laughs> okay. So um, what we're saying here, what we're saying here. Um, yeah. So now, now you're fighting under the Duvers. And you're slowly but surely you're climbing. You're climbing the ladder. Talk, talk to me. Talk to me, Calvin. You're climbing the ladder. Yeah, you're climbing the ladder. You know what? And that's a very pressurized uh, position to be in uh, because you can't lose in boxing. That's the thing. You know, boxing is a sport unlike MMA, unlike wrestling, unlike all these other franchise sports out here as a team sport. You can lose and have a bad night, but you can't lose and have a bad night in boxing. You have to win. And, and you have to win looking impressive. Mm-hmm. Roughly mm-hmm. by knockout. Because if you lose looking bad or have a lackluster win, that can be almost the same as a loss. Where the 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 media and the fans, the television executives really don't care to see you anymore. They kind of write you off. So the pressure going in when you're building up. Each boxing match is like a championship. You have to be prepared to look and fight your best and go in there and make people want to see you again. So it basically more of, uh, you know, although it's boxing, it's also marketing. You know, the boxer and being a business in and of himself, marketing his own product as himself to the fans, trying to get sold to the television. So it makes the life easier when you can do that for the promoter, for your team, to get you to the top, and and, and you know that was that was the major pressure part, and and not losing, not getting caught. So mm-hmm. you know, it's like a relief once you get to the championship. Believe it or not, you got to cross over and win that world title. Unfortunately, I didn't, but to get there and to get paid right, you got to get there undefeated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
get there. And that, that's why, that's why, that's a really good point because that's why these guys now, these guys now are very, very careful. They're very, very careful about, about the matchmaking. They have to win. They have to, they have to get to the top and keep maintaining their O. They have to because if they one loss will set you two years back. Mm. Mm -hmm. One loss can take you two years back. So yeah, that's a wrong loss can set you two years back. Now, if it was a controversial loss, then no. But mm. a loss where you get beat, yeah. two years back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The time, they're just going to put their energies towards someone else in the stable on the roster. Yeah, yeah, that's cutthroat. That is very, very cutthroat. Um, that's the business, man. That's just a, just like nothing personal. That's just business. Like, okay, you know, this person, we got to build them back now. Let's put a little bit more energy to the next one. You no, know, cause if a promoter don't, if a promoter doesn't keep televised dates, then that promoter gonna end up out of business. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that dates. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so they gotta keep, they gotta keep the dates, they gotta keep the dates, they gotta keep, they gotta keep the product, they gotta keep the product fresh, you gotta keep winning. Ain't no way, and that's what makes it very, very hard for other promoters to get into boxing because the dates are all tied up mm -hmm. over here in the United States. Is all Bob Arum, Golden Boy, Al Heyman, those three, they have all the dates, man. So, yeah. how is somebody going else get in there? And, 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 and compete with them guys when they don't have dates. You can't even attract the, the top talent without dates. Nobody in their right mind going to sign with a promoter that's a top talent if a promoter don't have dates to market them. They, if they mm -hmm. don't have the world champions to put them on a, underneath the world championship cars to build them up marketably in front of the press. Yeah. And the production executives, they're not going to get there. I don't care how good they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You gotta have those dates. You gotta have those dates. Yeah, the pressure, the pressure. Um, so let me let me let me let me talk about let me talk about um, let me talk about the the mental the mental aspect of the game um, because every fight you have to well it's not even even before you get to the fight even before you get to the fight I remember because you know I've done a little bit I've done a little bit you know um, and. Uh, Sometimes, sometimes you see someone, speaking from my personal point of view, sometimes you see someone inspiring and you think to yourself, damn, I'm next. <laughs> you see somebody inspiring, looking really good, and you think to yourself, damn, I'm next. Did, did, did that ever happen? You see somebody that's just that good and you think, damn, damn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> frame, uh, I remember when I first started uh, back in 2001, when I was my first year in pro, when I was living out in Vegas, I would go to about boxing matches. And um, at that time, Vladimir Klitschko, he was W.O. World Champion. Mm. So I saw him box against Jamil McQuine and Charles Schufer right there at um, the Mandalay Bay, I believe it was. And I was thinking, like, you know what? I'm going to have to fight this guy one day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be one champion. I'm going to have to fight this dude one day. And I'm, like, and I'm thinking, like, at the time, you know, I know I can't beat him today. I ain't good enough. You know, something got to get done. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so big, you know, like, yeah. you know, yeah. Lucky, but he wanted to go better too. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, you, you just feel like, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna have to fight this guy one day. Yeah. What am I gonna do to overcome him? And um, mm. yeah. So by, by the time I had gotten to him, I was confident that I would probably win the boxing match. I knew what to do. It wasn't a problem then. Mm. But the bar frame of uh, preparation, man, starts starts from the time that that match is made. Mm. Yeah. It, it's a constant thought every day. Yeah. Everything you do. When you're in training, the uh, uh every round that you train, you thinking of that boxing match. Yeah. 
not just sparring, not just watching film. You're thinking about how you eat, how you train every round, every punch on the bag. That's mm. the person you're seeing. That's the person you're dreaming about. Uh, so when you get to the boxing match, you are ready to fought that match so many times in your mind. Mm. Although what makes you nervous is, is how tough of a boxing match is it going to be? What's going to happen in a boxing match? I, I'm confident I'm going to win it, but what's going to take place throughout the process of me winning it? Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, are things going to go according to my strategy and plan that I envisioned it? Mm -hmm. if it doesn't, then you know, you got to also how your mind prepared. I gotta change. Yeah. You know, prepared to, you know, switch up. And that's what beat a lot of boxes. They can't change once their plan is on working any longer. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Switching it up, switching it up, yeah. um, mid flow, um, coming back, coming back against ad adversity. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask some real, I'm going to ask some real simple questions now. Some real, real simple questions that somebody who's never, ever done anything, anything like this before might ask. Um, does it hurt? Does it hurt when you, when, 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 when you're in there, when you're in there, is, does, does, do, do, does, does every round hurt or do you get through some fights and say, come out at the other end and say, wow, that really didn't hurt? And then another fight, you might come out and say, oh, my God, I feel like I've been run over by a truck. You know what? I think over the years, you get used to learning what a punch feels like. I say the most hurtful blow you could take is probably a body shot or a shot that a shot to the ribs that bruises your ribs. Or, or a shot, a hard shot on the nose, right? Um, that that really goes against the college of your nose. Mm -hmm. it hurt. But even even when you get to that level, when you're in a boxing match, where you understand that no matter what, I got to win this boxing match, right? You, uh, the mind and the focus go beyond the any kind of pain you may be experiencing. To you know what, I'm willing to almost die in here to get this boxing match won. So yeah. the pain and, and, and the infliction of the punches, you kind of already mentally prepared to go past that. But like, you know, I don't like getting hit, but I'm going to have to die here not to win this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Livelihood, you can't lose. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but then on the flip side, on the flip side, let's say... Let's say you were going in with Ernie Shavers. Let's say you were going in with Ernie Shavers. Now, you know who Ernie Shavers is. We all yeah. know who Ernie Shavers right. is, and we all know what he does. Right. Talk me through your mindset. Talk well, me through your mindset. Your... Going in there with, with Ernie Shavers is don't get hit with the right hand. Hmm. Now, that's the mindset. I mean, that's every boxer. You know what their strengths are. Uh, you know, say, okay, well, you know, I, I can't take the, too many of these punches. You, 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 Everybody know that they're human. Yeah. No matter how tough they are, you got to know. Hey, listen, mm -hmm. you know, I can't take Calvin. You got to speak to yourself. Encourage yourself, Calvin. Well, yeah. No matter what, do not be taking these right hands. <laughs> 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 hey, you want to win? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, how do you not take? How do you not take the right hands? I mean, the right hands come in. So what you what you you leaning back and parrying? You're leaning back and parrying. Is that is that what you do? Well, you know, according to your style, you gotta know how to get past a, a strong point of a boxer. I mean, usually good boxers not gonna get hit with many right hands out of a in a 12 round boxing match because they're good. Mm -hmm. and that's why they were at the top. Yeah. You taking you know right hands and hooks across the face, man. I mean right. yeah. That better just happen once or twice in a box match. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want, if you want longevity, absolutely. If you want longevity, and they'll knock out puncher like uh, Randy Shavers. You don't want to take any right hand. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, we're talking about those. We're talking about that mindset now. You, you, as you climb the ranks, you know a certain amount of pain may be involved. Um, and so you condition your mind as well as your body for that. But did you ever walk out of a boxing match feeling like you'd been run over by a truck? Yes, man. You know what? Every boxer, 
I guarantee you. When they're in that dressing room prior to the boxing match, or when they're back in that dressing room again after a tough boxing match, they have all asked themselves, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Have to. What have I got myself into? What am I doing? Yeah, of I mean, course. It's something about that dressing room when you have to go out there in front of a crowd of people. Mm. Box, mm. Man, it's kind of barbaric. You know what yeah. I mean? It's very barbaric to do that. And, and like, especially, especially me, that I had a college education, I had a corporate job at a bank, and I, I didn't have to do that. And so, you know, it, it, many times out, uh, I'm asking myself, why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and then we get back in the dressing room from a tough box of night, you might say, I ask myself, man, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. Of course. Yeah. But it's, it's the goal, the goal, mm. the consistent goal, that dream that keeps you driving. Yeah, yeah. And um, after you get through it each time, is there a bit of an adrenaline, adrenaline, adrenaline rush because you've just done something crazy that a, an intelligent, an intelligent college-educated banking guy like you doesn't have to do? Um, is there an adrenaline rush? Do you feel like, yeah, I've just, I just kind of almost dodged the bullet again. I'm good. Let's go for the next time. I, yes, I can tell you what keep everybody going. Mm. It's that walk to the ring of all that, that excitement, that walk to the ring, and that celebration and, and that accomplishment of a win. Yes, those are two things that really keep you going. Yeah, I'm telling you. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you love the sport, yeah, you know, the the boxing match is the funnest part. Nobody likes to train. Mm -hmm. Nobody I know that likes to train that's a real fighter. Mm -hmm. But that walk to the ring and the celebration of winning is mm -hmm. what keeps you going, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the adrenaline. It's that adrenaline rush. They it's fight that. like no other. And yeah. you know what? It's all yours because they only mention in one name for the winner. Yeah. So the the introduction of the boxing match, they only mention your name. Mm -hmm. Maybe along with, well, not to get back. They'll mention the promoter and all this and that, you know, prior to the boxing match. But yeah. after the boxing match, when they announce the winner, only one name gets mentioned. Mm -hmm. The boxer. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 And it's like a, it's like a, it's like an adrenaline sport as well. It's like an adrenaline sport. Every time you win, that must be one burst of adrenaline. That must like, yeah, I got through it again. I've done it again. The adrenaline must be through the through the roof. Excuse the sound for a minute. He about the, you know, the young, the lawn care persons doing the yard and. Yeah, it ain't too bad. It ain't too bad. It ain't too bad. Yeah. Where my office is at. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good. Uh, that's a good thing about the headphones. It cuts out a lot of that. Cuts out a lot of that noise. Uh, so that's that's cool. Um, where where are we? I think somebody just asked a question here. Uh, Calvin, you fought and beat Clifford Etienne. Your thoughts on him? From what I understand, he ended up back in prison. Yeah, Clifford Etienne, man. He was a, a top. He was a top up and coming guy. <clears throat> he just come down when I boxed him. But he was still at the top. He had just finished boxing against Mike Tyson. So that's at the very top. Mm. Um, he has upset some opponents, believe me or not. Some Olympians mm. with Lawrence Clay Bay. He had beat some other top fighters. And uh, he was good in there. You know, I was just that determined to win. And and uh, it was sad to see him, you know, take that fall to where he's spending his life in prison. Like wow. That. It's, it's just... I, I still think about that sometimes. Mm. Um, mm. Etienne, him taking a fall like that because it really, after the boxing match, he was a nice guy, like most boxers are. You know, he wished me well in my career. He thought I'd be going to the top and all, mm. but uh, I thought he was he. I mean, uh, I don't know what he thought, but yeah, you know, he was a good fighter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and so yeah, so. The euphoria, the euphoria, the excitement, the adrenaline, the buzz, the rush. Um, do you also get the feeling that you're doing something that 99.9999 people couldn't do or wouldn't do? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. Most people can't do it. 
Yeah. And so uh, I'm a star in my own eyes. I mean, all those people out there in the audience that have paid to see me. Yeah, yeah. So you're very much aware you're doing something that only the the one percent of the population um you, you're involved in something that only a one percent of the population would it would, would 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 consider doing. You're aware of that when you're doing it. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, it's probably less than one percent, man. Less than one percent. Yeah, Choice probably negative zero <laughs> <laughs> for real, for real, for real. You know, make their living and come back only, only yeah. come back. I mean, you just don't find people that way. You know, yeah, it's crazy. I go to work, but when you don't do anything else, then you just are so 100% gladiator. Yeah, wow, that's, that's like that's very unusual, man. <laughs> that's just rare. It's very rare. It's very rare. It's rare air. It's rare air. Um, did you, did you, because the Klitschko, Vladimir Klitschko, those are the, the Klitschko, the two clits. They were, they were the predominant guys of the time. Who is it? Put them aside. I'll come back to them. Um, who is it that you, you wanted to fight? Who just left? Who just left? Who just retired when you was coming up? Who's, who retired when you were coming up and you wanted to fight? Where well, was Lennox Lewis? Where was Lennox Lewis? Lennox Lewis retired as I was coming up. So did Mike Tyson. No, Mike Tyson, no, he was still around. He was still around. But those guys, Vendor Holyfield, Mike Tyson, those were guys that was boxing before even began to box. They were the ones I grew up watching. They were more like my models, my idol look up to. So really, I didn't have any kind of desire to you know, boss against those guys because – they're the ones that kind of like I kind of emulated. Yeah. You know, they were like yeah. my heroes. So, uh, you know, the, I mean, it would have been good if they had they been around still because they would have kept the money in the sport. Unfortunately, when I came along, a lot of the money had left. The money has come back since a whole lot, but the money had is pretty much exited boxing during the era when I was boxing, you know. The heavyweights weren't making the kind of money uh, that Lennox Lewis, Mike Tyson, Holyfield was making. Why? I don't know, man. It's like uh, I think heavyweight, the heavyweights carried the division, and and, and once Lennox Lewis retired, I think people just lost interest. Um. So I have to ask the obvious question: Was it because of the Klitschko's? The Klitschko's. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna put it to you. The Klitschko's. This is what said: The Klitschko's killed, killed boxing. Under their reign, uh, I don't think the Klitschko was killed by son. the heavyweight division. They killed the heavyweight division. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe in the United States, mm -hmm. maybe in the United States they did because they are Ukrainian, they, they're Europeans, and over here we like domestic champions. That's what that's what we we were used to. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they didn't have the most interesting style in the world. Very effective, but not the most entertaining. Mm, um, yeah. But, you know, those guys huge over in Germany. Huge. Massive. Yeah, massive. So I can't say that they hurt boxing at all. Unfortunately, you can mention the Klitschko's and peace. Some people still don't know who those guys are. Sad. <laughs> they, 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 they killed they killed the heavyweight division they killed the heavyweight division because all of a sudden for the first time in living memory um the best heavyweights weren't in america right first time in living history the the the, the best heavyweights were not in were not in america it's not like america had a portion of the belts and then europe had a portion of the belts they had all the belts they had, had all the belts in the Ukraine. Had all the belts for a lot of years. For many years. For a lot of years. Up until Deontay Wilder, a lot of years. And now they have them all again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we've got them now. It's okay. We've got them. We are over in the UK. We got them now. So they're in good hands. They come back home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's no. a news, man. I mean, Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury, man. I mean, talk yeah. about it. Talk yeah. about it. Talk anybody about it. Those dudes. Say it again. Not anybody's gonna beat them. <laughs> they can probably beat each other. They yeah. can probably beat each other, but yeah. outside of them, I don't think anybody's gonna beat them. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about talk to me about 
talk to me about Anthony Joshua as as a as an American, as a ex. You got to the pinnacle. You fought for the champion, so that's the pinnacle. As a as a ex, as a well, a guy who got to the pinnacle, as a heavyweight boxer who got to the pinnacle, and as an American, talk to me about Anthony Joshua. I'm a huge fan of Anthony Joshua. I mean. I mean, the guy is, is is you got some people as a, probably the sport is 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 pretty much like they are a God's gift or the or the sport of boxing is a God's gift to them. Right. Uh, he had a I mean, the dude won a gold medal on the just over with, with just over thirty some boxing matches. That's right. And he come out making all this money, and then he becomes world champion after about what 16, 17 boxing 16, matches. 16, 17, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then unifies the titles and he makes all these millions. And he's at the top. He regains the title. I mean, and this this dude is sound, man. He's just not a big guy. He's sound. He's talented. Man. He's a I mean, he's extraordinarily good. I mean, he can be around for a real long time. Mm. And, uh, I mean, what can you say, man? I mean, taking uh, he's a physical specimen mm. that very very trained very well uh, um, very athletic got a lot of conditioning it's it's, it's hard to compete against that for anybody mm. yeah yeah anybody yeah. No matter how good they are it's hard to compete against that and mm. Tyson Fury likewise Tyson Fury for somebody's size he's a total package he yes the most skilled boxing heavyweight division yeah yeah, and yeah. Against, they're gonna beat him that's even why he's undefeated the guy can do it on the inside. He can do it on the outside. He's well conditioned. Uh, I don't think anybody's gonna beat that guy. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna. It's a, it's a big ask. It's a big ask. Um, Fury, I think, like you say, he's probably the best. Um, the best, technically, the best uh, heavyweight out there right now. Um, he's been boxing since he was a child. Joshua started when he was around eighteen. Um, Fury was doing it in it before he reached double digits. Um, so he spent a lot of time, he spent a lot of time in the ring, um, for his years, his 31 years. I don't know, started when he was about eight, something like that. Spent, spent many years, many years in the ring. Yeah. Um, so that's, 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 that's where the, that's where the ring craft comes into it. Right. So he can't go through the weight classes. Yeah. Like, yeah, just like most heavyweights, they don't just start out in the gym as a youth as a heavyweight. They start out, they, they can then they come up into the weight classes. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. So you learn how to fight. Yeah, that's how you learn to fight. That's how you learn to fight. Um, and uh, I want to step away. I want to step away for thirty seconds, but uh, talk to me about Deontay Wilder. <sighs> Deontay Wilder, I mean, people can say that, oh, man, he wasn't that good anyway. And he was good. I mean, I, I, Deontay Wilder is a specimen as well. He's not easy for someone that doesn't have height and length to deal, I mean, to uh, to handle that well. I mean, for him to go to the Olympics uh, with a very inexperienced and win the bronze medal is very difficult. Because yeah. I was this them. Then for him to turn professional, and knock all those people out, even if you're not boxing the greatest competition, it's still not easy to, to knock out everyone. And they win a world title and uh, had that kind of mind frame, that maturity to 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 compete at that level. I mean, you had to give them all credit. I mean, he was um hell like what 10, 11, 12 title defenses or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, about eleven or twelve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> To do man, so he's really been a great world champion, mm -hmm. and um, fortunately, he's able to get a run. You know, he's able to get a run now. If I was him, honestly, man, I wouldn't rematch Tyson Fury because I'm not, I don't believe he will beat him outside of a, a punch that he may land and win by knockout. But you know, skill for skill, specimen to specimen, I can't see it, and I don't think it'd be good for his career to take two losses back to back. Like that, like that, like that. Um, we're gonna come back to that in a second. We can continue talking about other boxes, then we're gonna get back to you. 
Uh, we're mixing it up. We're mixing it up. If that's okay with you, Calvin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me go into the chat now. Let's acknowledge the chat. Thanks for everybody who's come in. Uh, people, tell me, did you receive a notification? Did you receive the notification that this, this video was live? Um, yeah. So let me go into, let me go into this chat right here. Um, okay. We've got Heinrich Smiths in the building and, uh, who else we got? Who else we got? We got, uh, yeah, I'll get to some, I'll get to that question in a second, Heinrich. Um, yeah, it's a good question there from Marla. We're going to get to that shortly. We got AD up in the building. We got to you and Calvin every time. Absolutely. That's AD. Um, yeah, man. Big time. Big time. Okay. Okay. So we got Big Ant up in here as well. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to get to the questions, folks. Keep the questions coming in. Um, and I'll circle back. I'll circle back and get to them. But in the meantime, we're talking about Deontay Wilder. So Deontay Wilder is getting a hard time now. He's getting a hard time now after his loss to, to, Tyson, Fu to Tyson Fury. And uh, Calvin, you make a good point. You say you wouldn't even, if you were him, you wouldn't even bother rematching him. Talk us through that. Boxing is a business. And if you're going to step in that ring, you want to step in there and get paid for as much money as you possibly can. Yeah. And you don't really want to uh, risk that, you know, jeopardize that opportunity because boxing is a very unforgiving sport. I mean, Deontay Wilder has to know that already himself. Boxing is a very unforgiving sport. I mean, he only has one loss and everybody's hard on him. <laughs> you know, can say that, you know, he was, a, he was, you know, whatever they're saying about him. Yeah. But the truth is, you no, know, you can't. You have to be great to do what he's done already. Hmm. Uh, and 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 to 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 timing is everything. Too timing is everything. Uh, it's it would be best for him to just. He don't have to have a championship to make a lot of money. Hmm. People are gonna watch Deontay Wilder. Yeah, they're not gonna watch him if he lose again. Maybe hmm. and the. And people write them off. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and it's hard. And you know what? Believe me. Believe me. With this management team that he has in place and people he has around him, a very smart business people, they've probably already said to him what about what I'm saying right now. But he being a fighter and his, you know, the ego and want to be the best, have something to prove. It's kind of hard sometimes for a boxer to accept that. Yes, yes, kind of go around and you know, just just you know, not face the top competition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's uh, he's like 35 this year. That's still young for him, though. The only reason why, because he hasn't been really hit like that. Yeah, he hasn't been knocked out. No, I mean, he don't, I mean, he hardly take any punches. Mm -hmm. so, you know, tall, long, Lincoln like him, they can have a very long career. He might can boss all the way up until he's about 45, 46, 50 years old if he wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Are you being serious? Are you well, being serious? Oh, man, look at George Foreman. Yeah. George Foreman took a while off, but you know, you got a boxer man that's just taking punches and, and he's his fight's been short. Yeah. Yeah. And he hasn't been in a hard fight. His, all his boxing matches have been short. Hasn't he made enough money yet? Oh, you know, you can't make enough money, man. You got to make a whole, whole lot of money in boxing. Yeah. But I realize, you know, after, after paying everybody and taxes, you're only walking away with maybe like 40, 42% of your net money. Yeah. Yeah. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Then you're spending some, some, some of it. So, you know, if, it, mm. if he made $100 million, Man, you know, he may have netted forty million dollars, but he hasn't made a hundred million dollars. You see what I'm no, saying? No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. But but there's a narrative. There's a narrative that he got beat so bad, he got touched up so bad last time around. He should take the money and get the hell out of it. He did not get beat up like that. I don't know what people talking about. I mean, it's one thing he, you know, uh, uh, the, it was. It, 
It's, you know, he didn't get beat up like that. I seen people get beat up way worse than what he got beat up. He didn't really get beat up. Mm-hmm. Got a he dent in his head. And get beat up, huh? He's got a dent in his head. Said he's got. A, they say he's got a dent in his head, in his cheekbone. Yeah. That's what they say. They say. Yeah, literally a dent. In, little, literally a dent in his in yeah. his cheekbone. Um, I don't know. You, you're seeing it different to, to how some other people are seeing it. There's there's two different school of thoughts here. One was that he, he got beat up so bad that he'll never be the same. But you you've been in there, and to you, you're saying, no, nah, it wasn't that bad. No, it wasn't that bad. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. I got beat up worse than him against Vladimir Klitschko. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Yo, how did it feel? How did it feel to get? How did it feel to get beat up by Vladimir Klitschko? Yeah, I didn't really get beat up. I'm just saying. I, yeah. I took yeah. more jabs. I mm. took a harder right hand than what uh, Deontay took. I got dropped. He didn't get dropped. Yeah. Yeah. I so he was right. down with a body shot, but he didn't get what you say dropped, and he's mm. hurt. Yeah. You know. Mm. Uh, he didn't take a lot, a whole lot of head blows either. A lot of those punches were on uh, glass and blows. Yeah. I didn't see anything you really hit him solid. Mm. Face, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Or so Ali and Frazier kind of fight. He, he <laughs> was, you see? Oh, right. those, so, those wars. Right. Um, so okay. Okay, Calvin. So so what's 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 the what's the roadmap? What's the roadmap? You're in charge. You're in charge. What's the roadmap for Deontay Wilder now? What's the roadmap? Stay out the ring with for me, the, yeah. the world is his. Stay out of the ring with Tyson Fury and stay out of the ring with Anthony Joshua, man. I mean, stay mm-hmm. out of the ring with both of them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I mean, let them two guys unify the titles, fight somebody else. Let the titles get unified first. Go around, knock out some people, keep getting paid because he's on contract. He's getting, what, $15 million a fight at least? Why not? I mean, it's just business sense. I mean, you're gonna get paid for less competition, the same kind of money. You might as well, I mean, you may get pay per view a little bit more for fighting, but you have a longer career getting paid more over time if you just let those titles go ahead and unify themselves, and then and and, and then go for the world title again against those um tall guys. Cause he hasn't shown that he do real well against people his height like that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Even Gerald Washington kind of, you know, right. You know, g- gave him a little, gave him, gave him something to think about. Okay, right. so, uh, but, but, can he command big money? Not as the champion, surely doesn't he need the green strap? He's marketable. Yeah, he don't have to have a world title to command big money. Okay, okay. I mean, each and every time he step into the ring. People gonna want to see him. I want to see him. I mean, it doesn't he doesn't have to be world champion? I mean, people want to see the comeback too. They got to sell the comeback. Yeah, 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 yeah. Road to redemption. Yeah, road to redemption. You got to sell it. And, you know, I mean, he's he's still a very entertaining boxer. Yes, yes, yes. That's a very good perspective. That's a very good perspective uh, because a lot a lot of people are saying he ain't got no skills. He ain't got no skills. He's not a, what you call a full package. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have to have a full package at that kind of height that he has. Like, uh, you take um, Vladimir Klitschko. You want no full package skill, dude. You just know how to use what you use real well. Yeah. And the hook. And that's, I mean, Deontay has a jab, right hand, a hook, and a right uppercut. Mm-hmm. Uh, and great movement. He know how to use those. those. You know, he's I mean, he's not an inside fighter. You don't need to be an inside fighter. He's too tall for that. Yeah. I mean, Good at doing it with doing what he does. He's doing what he does. He's doing yeah. what he does. He's doing what he does. What do you think about the footwork? His footwork gets a lot of criticism. So he can't move his feet. He's got two left feet. Nah. Nah. He, he has good footwork because he gets out the right way. I mean, you don't have to dance and move around like Muhammad Ali to say you have good footwork. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be Fred Astaire. You don't nah. have to be Fred Astaire in there, Bow Jangles. You ain't got to be Bow Jangles. He uses his reach enough to land his jab and, and not get hit. And that's all he's supposed to do in boxing. I mean, that is footwork. Yeah. You know, um, you know, he know how to move forward, backward, and he know how to move around to the left and right. 
He knows the way around. The, he knows the way around the, the ring. Uh, that's footwork for what for him. That's all he need to use it for. Anything more is excess. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fascinating. That's very fascinating. Um, so th those those the three guys at the top. Um, you got the Wilder. You got the 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 Joshua, the unified champ, and you got the WBC champ now, um, Tyson Fury. So Wilder should stay away from Joshua and Fury. Um, go on a road to redemption, scoop those checks up, and um, and then what happens? Then what happens? The world title. I mean, it's going to get to that time of like, okay, you know, uh, what's the once the champion is unified, then who else is it going to be other than Wilder? People are going to demand the boxing match. Mm -hmm. So that's in fantasy land. But if we take a trip back to reality, uh, the reality is Deontay Wilder is fighting Tyson Fury again, probably this December. Talk to me about that. Man, gotta, man I think I don't see how much Deontay is going to do different from what he did in the first two boxing matches. So uh, I think I, I think given now Tyson Fury has really beat Deontay twice. Yeah, and he beat him worse the second time. I think he would probably beat him worse a third time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that confidence! Mm. He's coming in with that confidence with no fear that that. Yeah. I know I can beat this guy, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, I watched the boxing match, you know, but you know, it's, I don't, the only thing I'm, I'm going to give Deontay is a puncher's chance. That's it. Mm, 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 mm. Puncher's chance. Yeah. Um, uh, a puncher's chance against a boxer like Tyson Fury. That's not good odds. It's not good odds at all. It's not good odds at all. Um, but you know, so so <laughs> so 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 he's doing he's doing the wrong thing. Then he's doing the wrong thing by taste by facing Tyson Fury again. What happens when he gets beat up worse worse the next time? Will that be a bad beating? Will that be a bad beating? Because he's going to get beat worse the next time. The third time, I think so. I think so. That'd be a bad beating fiscally and to his career. Yeah, people I don't want to see him again, and not only that, man, that may destroy him. That may destroy his uh, mentally, his mental, mm. yeah. Mental like, and sometimes that can beat you worse than a boxer when you lose confidence, lose that hope, yeah, lose that drive, and it, it, it take you so far down that some, some some boxers can't even pick themselves back up, even train with that kind of intensity anymore. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like something just leaves out. Like they, they, they're no longer the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what Deontay Wilder's heading for. Um, having said that, having said that, uh, look at look at Joshua. Look what happened to Joshua. He got beat over there in Madison Square Garden, and then they went over to Saudi Arabia, and he came back. Yeah. Okay. Right. He came back, but look. He didn't come back as fierce as he did, as fierce of a boxer yeah. prior to the loss. Yes, he came back real, real cautious, not yes. taking chances. You see what yes. I'm saying? That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> he got into his psyche a little bit. You know what mm. I mean? Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, right. You know, and you know that uh, first loss. You pretty much almost you know, Andy, you know, Andy Root, um, Andy Ruiz, Ruiz. Right? yeah, Ruiz, yeah. Take another from he's good, mm. he's good. Uh, he's good, he's quick, he has great skills. I think he's good, he is. Uh, I think, I think Joshua on the first one, <sighs> he looked a little bit too dried out to me, man. Mm. Mm. Way too dried out. He, something went wrong with that training. Yeah, he, he had trained too hard, too long. Mm. Uh, was overtrained because he kept getting more and more tired. Yeah, it's a sign of being overtrained. Yeah, 
you would not catch a second win. You would go out there and nothing works. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. That's where he looked when he boxed against Ruiz the first fight at the Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. Then he, but in the second fight, he looked like Anthony Joshua, supposed to look. Mm. Touch mm. him. Yeah. Yeah. Hamed says, nice interview. Great guest to have on. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, okay, so now let's go over to the chat and uh, we got some random questions. We're going to fire at you, Calvin. Um, where are we? Where are we? How, how did it feel to meet Vladimir Klitschko? Mm, he was a gentleman. I mean, you know, he's not one of those people where you kind of – a little bit hesitant, wondering, okay, are you going to have to box this guy, I mean, fight this guy twice for one pay? I mean, it's, I mean, you know, I, unfortunately, I never had to fight anybody at a press conference, but there are some boxers <laughs> fight them at the way in of the press conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two fights for one check, two fights for one check. So I didn't have to really worry about that with him. Because these guys are gentlemen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> who did you who did you who did you think you might have to fight twice for one check? Give me a name. Oh, man, the first one came to mind probably uh Clifford at the end. Okay, because he was kind of crazy. Yeah, he was a little bit crazy. He was saying some off the wall kind of stuff, and, you know. Yeah, I, I, I was a little bit hesitant about, you know. At the um, press conference, I'll be in a fight twice. <laughs> 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 Other than that, just him, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just him, just him. Because, you know, you got some crooks. You got some crook. You got some thugs who are actual boxers. You got yeah. some thugs who are boxers. And, and I, know, I, know, I know a couple of well-known thugs. Uh, I think they've calmed down now, but they were boxers and known thugs. Right. And sometimes right. you have to fight those guys. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, and sometimes they bring their thug friends. Now, right. if, they're, if they're a thug and they're bringing their thug friends, and you're just there with your mom and your dad, you know, <laughs> you know, right? You know, you you know that you you yeah. you must have stories. You must have stories of thugs yeah. in boxing. Yeah, give me a story. Give me a story of a thug in boxing. You don't have to name no names. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, I was I, okay. This was back in. Um, it had it been maybe 2000. Okay, okay, we was in. I don't remember if we was in Las Vegas or if we was in Atlantic City, but uh, I did an interview. I did an interview, and and they asked me to rate these heavyweights A, B, C. Mm -hmm. So I gave the guy a B rating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, I can see where this is heading. Carry on. So we ended up meeting out there in Vegas, and <laughs> uh, he read about it and stuff. That's one thing I said. You know, I gave him a B rating, and I didn't think he had what it takes to for his upcoming opponent. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people had rated me C. Okay, I was you know number one in the world. You know, mm -hmm. big deal. I'm the one in control. Everybody in control. What they can do in the ring. Yeah. All right. After the boxing match, you know, he comes up to me with this gregarious, you know, he, you know, crowd of guys, you know, they Whoa. circle me up, you know what I'm Whoa. saying? Whoa. Thinking that, um, yeah, I'm thinking that, okay, all right, it's a, I'm get ready to get a beat down here, but they yeah. just want to beat me down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he comes up, and the funny thing is, uh, this, this was funny. He comes up, he said, he says, you know, you done run your mouth. Hmm. What did I say? Hmm. You've been running your mouth. Like, hmm. What did I say? You, know, you, mean, you, know, you tell me that I run in my mouth. You just tell me what I said. You know yeah. what he did? He looked over to him and his boss and said, What did he say? You read it. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. And the boy said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, so he 
stepped to his side. You know, he thought about it for a minute. And he said, you know what? You call me a beef fighter. And, uh, you know, the first thing, you know, I looked around me. These guys standing all around me. And I thought, the first thing come to mind, you know, no, man, I ain't say that, man. I ain't say that, man. You, you know, that's what the writer wrote. Then I thought, you know what? I ain't going to punk myself. I, I'm, I'm not going to punk myself. You know, we, you know, we have to fight up in here. I take a beat down. We just have to take a beat down. So I said, yeah, but you know what? I said that. Then he paused for a minute and looked at me. He said, well, you know what? You got the right, you know, to your opinion. You know, that's your opinion. You know, he said, but do, do me a favor. Keep my name out your mouth. <laughs> and, you know, we ended up, and then we ended up, you know, conversing a little bit. Then right before he left, he said, you know what? I can see you're a pretty nice guy. <laughs> 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 well, think, hey, man, how in the world are you gonna come up to somebody? Yeah, at a at around all these people in a at a at a Boston Coliseum. Don't know what I said. Got to ask your friend what I said. He don't know, and that could have went anywhere had I yeah. not been diplomatic about the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, because the first thing that came to my mind is like, you know, this dude's crazy. You know, what I'm saying, I mean, I'm married with him. Married, he's married with family. You know, I'm not trying to go to jail. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Make each other look bad. Mm. Not only just make each other look bad, but make two black people look bad. You understand? Yeah. yeah. We black on black, and we grown men. We married with families. Then and you just, you know, I just couldn't believe that. But when you say thug, you no, know, I guess thug. That, that's what thug means, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what. That's what thug. That's what thug. Kind of does, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, and they don't look around. They don't look around and take time to say, "Well, this is a black black tie event." Uh, there's people around. There's families around. There's women around. That doesn't that doesn't concern them. You know, the the ego the ego is out of control, and uh, the ego must be fed and satisfied in their minds. Right. I'm like, it's, it's I was in a situation. You know, I was in a situation where. Whereby, you know, because I'm I'm not a thug, I'm not a thug, but I was I was walking to work one morning, <laughs> and somebody who I know, <laughs> who you know, he runs up to me because he he's a thug, you know, he's a thug, he's a superman, you know, ex bodybuilder, martial artist, all this shit, pardon my language, and there's this there's there's um it's rush hour traffic. There's people going to work. I'm walking to work. And there's rush hour traffic. People are driving by in their shirts and ties. And this, this dude <laughs> wants to fight me when I'm in my collar and my tie. <laughs> <laughs> rush hour, rush hour in the morning. And I thought to myself, I thought just like you, I thought, D can, can you not see there's, there's people around, you know, going about their business and you want to fight me in rush hour? Are you right. crazy? Are you crazy? Yeah. There's, there's a time and a place for everything. You know what I'm saying? There's a time and a place for everything, dog. Yeah. Not the rush hour. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this was back in the day. This was back in the day. Um, but I think, you know, it's the bully mentality. It's the bully mentality when the bully thinks you're going to, you're going to say, uh, 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 and then you just think, you know, well, I wasn't surrounded. It was just him and another dude. But the other dude, he was kind of calm. So, you know, I had to, I had to, you know, I mean, I had to basically say, okay, well, let's go. Let's let's just go once and for all. This rush hour, you want to do it at rush hour? Okay, let's go. He backed off. But uh, that's what a thug does. A thug, they don't care about the situation, the time, the place, whether it's a, a black tie affair. They just see you. They want to run up on you. They want to teach you a lesson. And... um and then you have to be calm, I suppose. You know what I'm saying? Right. You have to do whatever you got to do uh, according to the situation. But yeah, that classifies as a thug. The way you impersonated his voice, I think I know it was, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> the impersonation was too good. You didn't realize and I didn't stop you. <laughs> you have to tell me when we get off the show who you think I'll it tell was. you. I'll tell you who I think it was. I'll tell you who I think it was. Okay. So back into back into the chat. Um, okay, so we've answered the Klitschko question. He was a gentleman. Um, 
Uh, do I ask this question now? Okay, let's let's. Well, you know what? Let let me ask you. Okay, so let's let's talk about the Klitschko fight. Let's talk about the Klitschko fight because you you fought. You you you're a fighter now. You're not too concerned about the pain because as a good fighter, you can avoid the best shots. You're gonna get some pain from time to time. That's something you accept. But you've conditioned your body for pain. You've conditioned your mind for pain. And you've pretty much accepted that pain is a part of the game if you want to get to the top. And now you're, you're number one. You've you reached the number one ranked in America. So so you're up there. You're up there. You, when you're number one ranked, you, you've, you've climbed to the top of the tree. You, you, you're the highest caliber. Everybody else in America is beneath you. And uh, now they tell me, they tell you, 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 who did you want to fight? Who did you want to fight? Who had the belts? Who had the belts? Who did you want? I wanted Vladimir. I mean, Vladimir, right. you know, you're going to fight for the world title. Uh, you want to get paid the most. Yeah. So I, I got paid the most for Boston, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You wanted Vladimir. And uh, talk, uh, talk about the process. Talk about the process. When they came to you and they said, uh, yo, we might have Vladimir for you. Talk about the process. Well, what happened was they had came to me once before. And I turned it down because it just it was, the money wasn't what I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. So I said, forget that, you know. And uh, I just keep boxing people and keep winning until I get what I deserve. Yeah. And uh, what happened was, you know, uh, for all champions even today, the production company at that time it was HBO, and they give champions a short list, you know. So. Uh, I was on the short list and it was me, Shannon Briggs, and it was someone else. I don't remember who the third one was. And Shannon Briggs uh, decided to go for the WO title. Uh, uh, he's with Don King. He, he decided to go and beat um, Sergey Leokovich and he won it. So that left me. I forgot why the other person, I don't remember who the other person was. Okay. But, when I was the last one on the short list, he had no opportunity, other, you know, no choice other than to take me as an opponent. They allowed me to negotiate a, uh, a, a good, a good deal. Right, right. So your people negotiated a good deal, a deal you were satisfied with. Right. And uh, the fight was made. Right. We 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 well, back and forth. You know, um, I mean, they okay. didn't accept my first offer. Uh, you know, uh, I didn't accept their first off. Right. Turned down twice. That's like that turned it down. So mm -hmm. then well, they pretty much just asked me, well, what do you want? I believe it was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so we ended up, you know, selling for, you know, a, a fair amount. Okay. 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 So the fight's made now. Uh, where did that fight take place? Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden. Have you had, had you ever fought at Madison Square Garden up until that point? No, no, no. Sir. So it's Madison Square Garden at this point. Where are you based in Pennsylvania? I was still living where I live now in Charlotte, oh. but I was to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for my training camp. Okay, okay, okay. For my training, right. so I flew into Madison Square Garden, uh, New York City, from Pittsburgh. Right. Okay. So you're excited. You're excited about it. How do you feel? How do you feel? It's Vladimir Klitschko. What, why do you feel your chances are? How do you feel you measure up? Uh, you know what? I felt that I would go in there and beat him. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't feel like I had the best camp. Uh, I feel like I may have overtrained. I went in there a little weaker than what I wanted to go in. But, you know, that really didn't affect my confidence and affect my belief at all that I would win the boxing match because any boss could tell you, each boxer probably can remember on one hand the number of times that they went in feeling great, the feeling that they had reached uh, you know, their A-level performance level. Mm -hmm. Usually you go in feeling like you're your B-level or going injured yeah. or going in, you know, something could be better. Yeah. And, but you still overcome. You know, you're right. riding on the occasion and you overcome whatever that is. And you kind of usually you end up surprising yourself by rising up to the level mm -hmm. and being better than what you ever was in the gym or even from your last Vasa match because of the level of the Vasa match and knowing that you had to perform. 
Right. So uh, I, when I went in there, I felt good uh, initially, but you know, I, I began to get weak real fast. And, uh, and he, he honestly, he was stronger and he was better than what I anticipated. Uh oh. Yeah, and, but but at the same time, I didn't see where he was so good that I couldn't beat him in there. I think what beat me most was my own conditioning. It got to the mm -hmm. point where I couldn't get out of the way of the jab any longer. I didn't have the movement that I wanted to move. I didn't have the strength and the power I wanted to have that I've had in some previous boxing matches. But that, but that, but that didn't hurt my confidence. It's like, okay, big deal. This is just for now. My inner size is going to make me better throughout this boxing match. I don't come up and win. But when I slowed down and started getting hit with two in the right hands, man, you know, mm -hmm. it was just like, okay, I can't no longer move out of the way anymore. You know, I have to knock this man out now. So then I pretty much started going for the knockout. Yeah. So he did land that right hand to kind of stagger me in the seventh round. Yeah. That's when I thought I had him. That's mm -hmm. when I thought I was going to really knock him out because he got away from his jab and started just getting all over top of me, throwing punches. And I said, now I'm getting ready to catch him. Right. But unfortunately, he caught me first. Mm -hmm. At that time, that's when I had the highest amount of confidence when he had hurt me and started jumping over me that I thought I had him where I wanted to have him. And now I'm going to knock you out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting hit first with something I didn't see. Damn. Yep. Damn. Damn. And um, that was it. Vladimir Klitschko held on to his title. Uh, titled was he unified champ by then, or just did did he just have the W? Was it WBA or was he? he uh, the 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 Abby Elf and the IBC title, I believe. He didn't have the WBA. You know, did he have the? You know, he didn't have the WBA title. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. He had so. the title. He won those because see, I was his first title defense after he regained the title from Chris Bird. Oh, okay, okay. I see that. Yeah, okay. So. So what happened to you then? What happened to you then after the Klitschko fight? When did you get the injury? When did you get the eye? The eye injury happened uh, just uh, a full year later. Because okay. I boxed against Vladimir in November of 06. So I boxed against my last, well, I boxed my last boxing match in November of 07. Mm -hmm. And training for the November of 07. Okay. So is that you know it was a red streak in my eye just where the detachment took place but okay so looks like looks like you're freezing up there looks like you're freezing up there calvin so um i think what you i think what best is that you okay i'm back Oh, you're back. Okay, okay. I'm so take now. take us to that. Take us through that story again. You was training for the November, the November fight. A year later, and then you noticed yeah. there was a red streak in your eye. Yeah, I know. I got jabbed in my eye training, uh, sparring, and you know it didn't hurt. It just left a red bloodshot streak in my eye. Mm -hmm. away. And it stayed there for probably about uh, six weeks. Wow. And that's when I be began to notice some vision changes. Uh oh. That, so I knew that you know, it was something the matter with my eye. But like I said earlier, you know, you get so used to going into Boston matches not 100% healthy anyway. Yeah. I ended up having to have a shoulder surgery after that Boston match, too, a, a couple, two or three months later. So I went to the, my last Boston match against Eddie Chambers with the with the eye problem and a, you know, a torn shoulder, but I was confident that I was still getting there and winning. And yeah. uh, I still won it. You know? mm -hmm. 12 rounds came up to a split decision, which I thought I won, no mm -hmm. question, seven out of 12, but really eight. And, uh, you know, I was on, you know, it came up, they gave it to him, so. They gave it to him. We're looking at your box rec now. You had 30, 31 fights. Um, two losses um that's a that's a pretty good and then uh then then you got then you had the injury before the eddie chambers fight um it's, it's pretty impressive looking through all these wins looking through all these wins and you've only got as far as i can see you've only got one legit loss you only had one legit loss and that was to 
Vladimir Klitschko. The other one, you went in with a damaged eye, and even then, uh, you still thought you won that one. So really, really, that was that's that's the last day, Vladimir Klitschko. Um, so what? So that's that's not too bad. That's not too bad. I mean, looking at that, I mean, most people would be happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nobody could be shamed for losing against Vladimir Klitschko, but the greatest world champion ever. No. Yeah. Yeah. I think most people, most people would be happy with that. I mean, the Eddie Chambers thing happened when you already had a serious, very serious eye injury. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that is very, that is very, very respectable. Calvin Brock, very, very respectable. When you look at that, all of those wins, all of those W's. Thank you. All of those W's. Um, I just want to make sure that people know, you know, <laughs> make sure that people know that um, it, ain't, it ain't easy. It ain't easy getting all those green, getting all that green on your record. Um, coming from a guy who was trained by his dad <clears throat> throughout his entire amateur career. Um, his dad who never boxed and wasn't a, wasn't a boxer, wasn't a boxer training, just the other trainers didn't work out. So your dad started looking at instructional videos, you and your dad, and that's how you got trained, got through the whole of your amateur career that way, and then uh, got all these W's in the pro, uh, made it made it to number one, America's number one, and um, made it in there, made it in there with Vladimir Klitschko. Um, that's pretty, that's pretty darned, that's pretty darned impressive stuff, pretty darned impressive stuff. Okay, so talk to me about the injury. You got the injury. Take it from there. <clears throat> you know, detached retinal, mine was very new. Um, minute. Very, mm -hmm. very minute. They, they could hardly even detect it. But it had to get attached back via surgery to keep from pulling apart. Because once it pulled apart to the point where it was in the middle of my eye, that I would have been irreversibly blind. So I was seeing still very well. Mm. But unfortunately, if somehow I came out of the surgery, not seeing out of it anymore. Wow. That was the end of my career right there. That was a devastating moment right there. Wow, 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 wow. Um, that's crazy. That's crazy. How old How old, old were you at that point? 32. 32. 32. Um, still, still in your prime now. You're in your prime. You're just getting started. You know, as a heavyweight, um, you're, you're rearing to go. You're rearing to go, but you can't do it. Talk us through that. Talk us through that mental process. The the difficulty because um, one thing one thing about boxers that I've noticed is when their careers end, even if they had a long career, when it ends, they 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 they've always got that sense of loss. So that I can only imagine that is intensified when you're cut short in your prime, literally cut short in your prime. You get cut short in your prime, and not only that, man, I got cut short. You're talking about at the end of 2007, now the recession coming in in 2008. So here I am, I can't see out my eye anymore. My, I'm, I'm, I, I'm suddenly out of my lifelong career that I've been working my whole life towards and can't continue on. And here I am facing a recession. I'm, I was um, losing a lot of money like everybody else was because you know, being a finance guy, I was invested in securities and real estate and all. Uh, it, it just was a, probably the worst time of my entire life, 07, 08. And, uh, I really, just like someone you know, I thought about you know, mm -hmm. wanting mm -hmm. to make more and taking my own life. Yeah, because you know, I just felt like maybe you know what? Am I doomed? <laughs> <laughs> We've all had that feeling. Am I doomed? Am yeah. I doomed? We've all had that feeling. Like, Am I doomed? You ask yourself that question. You look in the mirror. Yeah. Can I can I pull this back? Can I bring this back? Can I, mean, I, can I ride the ship? Can I write the ship? Can I? Can I? Can I write the ship? I'm the captain here. Am right. I qualified? <laughs> I don't think most people, man, do not want to get that low. When you get so low that you don't have one happy nerve in your body mm. and no place to escape, you know, it's 
it's tough, man. I just kind of like, you know, I feel for all of us boxers because, you know, fortunately for me, God brought me back. Yeah. For a lot of boxers, man, I can understand, man. It, it's what else do you do now? You don't have passion. You can't step out here and go to work and get a job and and pay and make what you were making to pay to to keep and pay for what you've accumulated. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, man, you know, I'm still in my. You know, I bought a real nice house. I'm still in the house. I didn't mm -hmm. load anything other than money. The recession took a lot of my money. It really did. But outside of money, it didn't take anything else away from me. It didn't take my house. It didn't take my marriage. I'm mm -hmm. still married. It, the recession broke a lot of marriages. Yeah. Took a lot of houses, a lot of assets, and it even took some lives. A lot yeah. of people committed suicide in that recession. So when you look at just the recession alone, mm -hmm. having lost a lot of what I've worked my whole life for, mm -hmm monetary wise and then coupled with having lost my career then having lost my vision in which i still don't have in my right eye here that hey. is a lot to live through yeah 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 we've all been there we've all we've all we've all been there we've all had to face the the question you with the realization that we are the captain of the ship and you look in the mirror and say I'm the captain, but am I qualified? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's only one way to find out. Yeah, you know, it's a sad state when you get to the point where you don't want to live anymore. Yeah, real low, low, sad state. And I got there. You know, you I'm gonna tell you, man. I'm gonna tell you. Mm. The only reason why I probably didn't kill myself because the only reason is. I don't know, and there's no answer in the Bible, and nobody can tell you an answer, that if you kill yourself, will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? Nobody I, can tell you that. I was told, I was told hell. I right. was, told, I was right. told hell. That's why that's how I was raised to believe. If, if you kill yourself, you're automatically going down. You're going down. That's what I've been told, but where is it in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. Huh? in the Bible, people just told that's what I've always been told too. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I don't want to go to hell, so I guess I, uh, no, no, I don't, I can't take that risk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big risk. It's a big I'm, risk. I'm low as low as I can go, but I want to go that low. <laughs> <laughs> for real, for real. It's too, too much of a risk. It's too much of a risk. You're weighing it up. You're going, hmm. I'm not sure about this is a tricky one. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want you don't want to take the chance and then find out. Damn. <laughs> right. right. Can you take that chance, man? Yeah, it's like, 50 50. And I put everything on red. I was honest to God, man. Just use my hand. Honest, my hand right here. Honest to God. Yeah. If I thought that I would have went to heaven during the time, I would have took my life. I was mm -hmm. there. Yeah. 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 During that period. If I thought for certainly I would go to heaven, I would have yeah. taken part for that time. Yeah, for the relief. Just just float away. Just float away. Float upwards. If you thought you'd float upwards, right. then, you know. I mean, like God said, you know, hope deferred makes the uh, heart sick. I mean, when all hope is gone and all hope is left, I mean, it's, that's, that's, that's what the first thing the devil tells you to do, take your life anyway. You just steal, kill, destroy. He tell you to take your life. But I didn't want to live no longer then, man. But fortunately, I didn't. I, you know, I, I, I didn't have any kids at that time, but my wife was pregnant. So, and then I really, you know, I wouldn't want to leave my own mom and dad. They kind of hurt. But, I mean, when you get that low, man, you forget about the kind of hurt you'll leave people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get you get absorbed absorbed yeah. into your own in your own world um so talk us through talk us through the route out of that place that dark place which many many boxers many many boxers no matter how successful they are sugar ray leonard end up on coke um a lot of boxers maybe even athletes in general they end up uh in substance abuse of some description you know what, man? I thought about that too. One time, I just wanted to be free, and I thought about maybe trying stuff like that. But you know what? The good thing was, I ain't, I, I, you know, I didn't know where to go get it. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> it's not like it's not like you can hit the yellow pages, especially back then. You know, it's not like you can hit the yellow pages. Um, your local your local dealer, right? Uh, and you, it's not like you can compare the prices. I mean, the thing that's the thing that gets kept me away from all of any of that stuff. Do you know? Do you know what it is? What? It's just that I like value for money and everything. I like value for money. Are you, are you like value for money? Value, value for money. When I buy something, I like to think I've got a really good deal. Okay, right, right. Now, for me to buy that kind of stuff, to me, just not good value for money. You know what I'm saying? Right. It can't, right. It can't so much, and it goes so quick. It just, it's not economic. I don't feel satisfied as a buyer. That you know, it, it's it's good value. Right. So. Uh, I didn't think on that that long though, cause like you know, I might go get some bad crap. You know what I'm saying? Who knows? <laughs> I don't. Uh, yeah. Place to go get that. So for me, man, for the the, the answer to the question is the best thing for people to do when they get lonely is is don't be by yourself. Mm -hmm. So with uh, I started attending a lot of different events, right? You know, banquets and got into some clubs. Make sure I, you know I started a brand new a very charismatic church at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you really want to be around people that, 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 that you just, we got um, excitement going on. Yeah. Happy people get around. Yeah. Happy people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and if you notice when people are going through bereavement, when they first have a loss after, after the funerals, when they get their lowest, when they buy themselves, once everybody leaves, they can yeah. get all right when everybody's around them, family mm -hmm. members, them, everybody around them, giving them all support, but was that that loneliness, that depression sets in once everybody's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people can relate to that because it, sometimes you can be all right until you go home, and when you go home, boom, you get depressed. <laughs> right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that's when you really you got to deal with the problems. You mm -hmm. know? So. Mm -hmm. And that's what bosses need to do, man. When when you get low like that, you have got the first thing, best place to go is get into a church. Yeah, I agree. Stay in there every time the doors open. Yeah. Um, outside of that, go to functions, go to events. Yeah. Like that, when people invite you, go get into some groups and everything. Mm. You know, if your money's short, and, and you know, it's you stay out, stay out of the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay out of the house. Yeah, get yeah. out there, mix and mingle, mix and mingle, be involved in positive, yeah. positive societies, positive groups. Right. Uh, you know, I went to a funeral, I went to a funeral last year, and um, the funeral was held at my the church I used to go to as a boy, as a child. And I looked around, and you know, I left that life a long time ago, and I looked around and I saw all these faces I hadn't seen for years and years and years. I said, I remember her. I remember her. It was all women. It was all <laughs> I remember her. I remember her. I remember. And, I, and you know, there was just such a feeling of, wow, I feel like I've reconnected with something that I didn't know I'd lost. I reconnected with something that I didn't know, realized that I'd lost. And there was such a, and then I understood why people go to church. For me, at that place, at that particular church, it was such a, a loving feeling right i felt like i was surrounded surrounded and enriched in a very positive positive feeling yeah and i think that that's what that's what religion uh, can do if you're in a good environment to, around good people exactly um so i totally understand that <clears throat> i totally understand that okay so you moved out of it. You moved out of it. You, you moved out of it. You know, a child was born. And you find yourself moving away from the darkest, the darkest hour. The darkest hour was behind. When did you realize that your darkest hour was behind you? Is your darkest hour behind you? Yeah, my darkest hour is definitely behind me, man. Uh, 2007 and 8, my darkest hours, dark, darkest days. Yeah. Uh, I think... Uh, I think it started getting behind me once I started working. Uh -huh. you know, um, I, I started out as a commercial real estate broker. That's a commission job. 
Mm. You eat what you kill. Yeah. I didn't saw anything. It was during the recession. But mm. just going to the office, learning something new, being around people, that helped a lot. Then I went from that job to another job to another job. And, and I, it wasn't, and I wasn't working to necessarily get my bills paid, but I was working to kind of like in search of what's next. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Because I don't know, because they don't really have a desire outside of boxing. Mm. So here I am, you're like, you know what? It's, it's, even if it's not paying my bills, it was paying me just to be around people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have an association to keep me busy out of the house. And, uh, and purpose, purpose. You have purpose. to have a purpose. You have to have a purpose to be yeah. happy. You to have to happy. have a purpose. And then uh, you know you go through a lot of jobs. Like I don't like this. I don't like this. And when you know mm-hmm. when you're dealing with jobs that's not paying your bills, you know you know you ain't gonna take no bull crap off of people. You know? That's right. <laughs> right. One hundred. Yeah. Hell yeah. So you know, like, oh, well, you're like, I, I don't want to do it anymore, you know? Uh, so I finally got into doing something I wanted, you know, really didn't like it a lot and still ain't really passionate about it, but roofing. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, it started to make real well. Mm. And, and it's never been hard and it always paid me well. And it happened to be with my dad and then I you know, hired my sister. I started with some other roofing company first and then stayed with them for a couple of months. And then they ended up going out. And then my dad asked me to come back over. I took the concept back over to him. This and they had, you know, never looked back. And then I got a dream venture that I'm, I've been working on for six years. So, you know, I kind of feel like I kind of uh, reinvented myself a little bit. I feel like I got some direction in my life, got something to live for. As a individual, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Heinrich Schmidt says one of the best soul shows thus far. Uh, thank you very much, Heinrich. Thank you very, very much. So now you found you found some direction, uh, and I think the key thing, the key thing there was get out of the house, find a purpose outside of the house, find something. Man was not meant to. Man was not meant to be unemployed. <laughs> man, right, man. man was not meant to be unemployed because in in the days in the days of old um you found your own employment you had to go out and chop some wood you had to you had to go and go and get some food you, you either had to plant the food in which case you're a farmer or you had to go and kill the food in which case you're a hunter but a man had in days of your historically a man has always had a purpose um, a man without a purpose, that's a modern, that's a modern invention. That's a modern invention. And we're not, we're not mentally, we're not mentally, mentally, we're not ready for it yet. Um, uh, we gotta have a purpose. Yeah. Got to, got to, you got to have a purpose. That's one of the keys. That's one of the keys to being happy ladies and gentlemen. Um, and, uh, so now where are you now? Where are you now? What's your position now? How are you? What's your standing? What's your, what's your, what's your feeling? Where are you now? 2020. I'm how, happy. Many, I'm happy. how many years, how many years you've been retired? How many years you've been retired? 13 years coming up okay. on 13, November 12, 12, 12, 12 years total coming up on 13 in November. Coming up on 13 years in November and you're in a happy place now. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a happy place now. Happy place. You got the family. You got the house. Uh, you got the the purpose every day, and um, you're still working on your own little little project on the side. Right. So you got your job and your hobby. You got my job and my hobby, and uh, I got my wife and my kids. I'm married to a lady I want to be married to. I'm happy with my wife. I got a beautiful family. You know, I got a great relationship with my parents. So life is good right now. You know, I'm really really blessed right now. This is one of these times I can really exhale and just breathe in. I better seize the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. moment. Because things ain't always stay the same, you know? Yeah. The moment. Right now, everybody healthy and everybody alive and good. So it's hopefully mm. a real long run. Get it, you know, like from decades out of this, hopefully. 
Yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> Get decades out of it. Rinse it. Rinse it out. Rinse it out. Rinse it out like the, like the, like them people who used to look for gold. Just make sure you keep on rinsing it out. You know, enjoying the moment, enjoying the time, enjoying where you got to was the top of your profession, the top of your field, got to the mountaintop. Okay. Okay. So you didn't stay there, but you did get to the mountaintop of one thing. And you had the fall, you had to tumble down, you had to come all the way back down, and you did. Um, you know, wins and losses. It's about wins and losses. And um, but you, you know, when you look at the balance book, when you look at the balance book, you have to say, I did, I came out of it pretty damn well. I came out of it pretty damn well. A lot of my brothers, a lot of my brothers were in this in this in this thing weren't so fortunate as I. Well, you know what? It's dreadful going down, man. You know, it's like it's dreadful going down. Mm. It's real dreadful. That's it's majorly dreadful. But <laughs> when you finally hit the bottom, when I yeah. finally hit the bottom, you know, that's when I got a little bit of joy because mm. you know what? This is the worst it's gonna get. Yeah, head back up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, hit the bottom, and then, and then that's 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 probably that's that's when you know that's when you know. Okay, now I'm really at the bottom. Now there's only one way up. Right. You know, only one way up. You know, I, I can only go up from here. I can only it can't get worse than this. You can't get worse than this. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so. So, okay, so we've done the interview. That was a great interview. Um, you, you're giving advice to, to other people, other boxers. Um, so so we got the blueprint. The blueprint is out there now. Great interview. And so we're going to finish this off by a question and answer session. We're going to get the questions from, from, the, uh, from the chat over here. Uh, everybody, by the way, if you like this video, and I'm sure you do, um, hit the like button. If you are not subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button. <clears throat> and um, what else is there? I will have, I will put Calvin. Calvin, are you on Facebook? Do you have social media or you don't bother with that? What, what do you uh, do? Yeah, I got Calvin Brock Facebook. You throw it on Facebook. Okay, so I'll put your, I'll put your, the, the link to you. I'll put the link to your, we'll talk after this and I'll make sure I've got the details and I'll put the link to your Facebook in the description box which will be beneath where's my finger beneath this video okay, okay. so that's where the description box will be uh, if you want to follow calvin on social media um, but we haven't finished yet we haven't finished yet we're going to do a little uh, question and answer session uh they'll put the questions in the oh and sorry please people don't forget to share the videos don't forget to share the videos on your social media, on your Facebooks, on your Twitters, on your Instagrams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's everything I want to say. Okay, so we're going into the question and answer session. Uh, I'm sure there's a few questions in here. Uh, I've, asked, I've asked a few, but there are a few more I have not yet got to. Okay, so let's do that now. Um, where are we? Okay, I've asked that one. Okay, so Marla says, Calvin, did you end up financially secure from boxing? So many many fighters do not. I did. I did not end up financially secure. Uh, and then the money that I did make, man, I ended up losing it in the recession. Ended up getting mm -hmm. all gone. That's what rock bottom. I mean, that's that's what I say. When I hit, I hit the bottom, it's all gone. It's go back, go back, go back up. Uh, most boxers uh, get. This is being everybody knows the same boss that you know, financially secure. Uh, well, most of them aren't, man. They go through it. You got to get, I mean, like I said earlier, a boss after he pay everybody in Texas, if, if they pay Texas, 40 to 42 percent of your money. Hmm. You got to understand here. I mean, to be financially secure, I mean, uh, and you spend some of it, you need to have a net clear at least ten million dollars. Hmm. You know what hmm. I'm saying? And yeah. even, even then, if you look at investing in ten million dollars, if you got ten million dollars and you go out here, you can buy 
you know, twenty, thirty million dollars worth of real estate, then yeah, you can be all right. But most bosses ain't really, you know, savvy enough to do that. A lot of times they get taken advantage of. Or well, even if you put it in a safe bond where you're getting five percent, you got ten million dollars, so that's only five hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. So you know, how lavish can you live with five hundred thousand dollars a year? You still gotta live like pretty modest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you can live good off of five hundred thousand dollars a year. I know, but in some places like London and some places in the United States, you can't live lavish off five hundred thousand dollars a year if you got a family. You know, mm-hmm. you got to live pretty modest still. So you know, unless a boxer gets out here, man, he makes a uh, hundred million dollars. He he make hundred million dollars. He got forty million dollars. I mean, not me. A boxer gonna get to that level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I mean, they don't get to the level. So I got nowhere near that level. So I didn't come close to being financially secure. No, not like I wanted to, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that answers that question. But you managed to write the ship after boxing. Yeah, after boxing, I, mean, I ended up being just fine. I mean, I actually, uh, so I do better than what a lot of my people that that's, that's been working ever since they've been out of college with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there is life after boxing. You can turn things around. You can, if you make sensible moves. Um, right. Yeah. So let's go to the next next question. Um, where we at? Where we at? Where we at? How does it? How does it feel like to get so money, so much money at once? Oh man, it's great when you get a windfall of money. <laughs> I mean, a windfall of money, man, changes a lot of things very, very fast. Yeah, very fast. It changes things for the better. Mm. And, uh, you know, a windfall of money, you just can't get carried away with it. But you got to realize that you know you get carried away real, real quick and. And get a lot of money. I didn't. I lost more than what I spent with my money. I was more, you know, thinking on long term investing, you know, stuff like that. But a windfall of money changes, takes away a lot of problems real fast. Takes away a lot of problems real fast. Did you ever have problems with hangers on? Did you ever have problems with hangers on? Uh, no, I didn't. I'm not. I've always been kind of a loner anyway. You know, so, I mean, I obviously wanted to take care of my family. I wish I could have took care of them better. Mm. But uh, I didn't have any problems with hangers on. I didn't have any hangers on. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, Brock, this is a good question from Big Ant. What was your, I think I know the answer, though. What was your toughest fight? Vladimir Klitschko for the world title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you bruised him up though. You bruised him up, and you cut, you bruised him up on, on the left hand side around his ribs. Yeah, well, he's he's tough 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 I mean, up until Anthony Joshua, he said I was as tough as a point. He said that. Oh, damn! Say that. Damn. damn. Yeah, because he's all bruised up. Uh, there's a picture. There's a picture out there. I don't know if I can find it. There's a picture out there of his right side, and it is all, it's all bruised up. Okay, yeah. I can't see it right there. I see it right there. This just then, but um, so I know you put so I know you put some work on him. I know you put so I know he'll remember you. Um, and let's go to let's go to another question in here. Um, where are we? Ask what he thinks. Yeah, ask Brock Calvin Brock what he thinks of Dillian White. Yeah, Dillian White. I haven't. I know who he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't really watched him. Yeah, I know he is. I, I haven't really watched him. I think I watched a recorded about a match when he fought uh, Anthony Joshua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. First yeah. Time when he challenged for the world title or, or he, Anthony Joshua. He wasn't, I don't remember, yeah. what, but Anthony Joshua stopped him, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. So I think he stopped him in the seventh. Uh, that was a few years ago now, maybe three, four years ago now. So uh, they're, both, they're both developed. Um, I'll put it like this. If I was still boxing, I think I'll take him. Okay, you take you take Dillian White. You take Dillian White. I think I would beat him. Damn, damn. So Calvin Brock is issuing 
is issuing a challenge to Dillian. <laughs> I, said, I said, if I was still boxing. <laughs> you see how journalists like to misquote you. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. So you fancy your chances against Dillian, but you don't fancy your chances against Joshua or Fury. No, nah, man, that would be a huge risk. I mean, yeah. I would go in there very uncertain. I would, I, would, I, would, I would really put my butt on the line, Mr. Mm. Guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about how do you fancy your chance against Deontay Wilder if you were still boxing? Oh, uh, could you get out I, of the way? Could you oh, get out of the way of the big right? I, oh, yeah, I'll be out of the way of the big right, man. Yeah, well, if you get out of the way of the big right, then you win. Yeah, if you get away, the big, yeah, I think I'll. Come out on top, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, okay. So you beat Dillian, you beat Wilder, but Joshua and Fury, they're just a little half a step ahead of you, half a step ahead of you. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to get to them. Right. Why? 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 What's what's the yeah. difficulty in getting to what's the difficulty in getting to Fury? Uh Fury, Fury, Fury. I mean uh, he know how to he know how to handle his business on the inside and the outside on the outside. Mm. You know, he, he the man can move. He can tie you up. You know he has a real nice defense. Yeah, his height six nine is what he is, right? <laughs> yeah, and with that jab that he has and that movement that he has, it's a, it's a problem. It's a it's problem. A problem. It's a problem, man. It's a problem. But if I was your trainer, if I was your trainer back then, I'd say Calvin, keep your hands up and and go. Go Joe Fraser style to his body. If you can get to it. If you can get to it. Yeah, I'm talking about the bobbing and weaving. I'm talking about the Floyd Patterson, the 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 Joe smoking Joe Fraser to the body up in the head. Maybe an accidental headbutt. Accidental yeah. headbutt. He that Tyson Fury is harder to get to than Vladimir Klitschko and Vitaly was. Damn. Damn. Yeah, he's he's hard to get to than what them guys were. And nobody could get to Vitaly. Damn. I mean, you talk about that linking, that kind of movement, man. That that movement, linking, and that uh, looseness, that slickness he has. Yeah. That jab and his long balls and his great defense. Mm. Not gonna get to him. His head movement. He's not going to get to him that easy, man. Not going to get to him that easy. But Otto Wallin cut him over the eye. Otto Wallin cut his eye. Who did? So he got to him. Who did? Otto Wallin. Otto Wallin. Uh, about oh, two okay. fights ago. Uh, yeah. Well, you know. It's not impossible, bro. I'm telling you. Yeah. But you look, 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 Otto Walliam, his name, I may be pronouncing it, but he's taller than what I am. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I'm just six one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> you're just a short guy. You're just a short guy. <laughs> so anyway, you know, you know um, 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 the, the guy you just mentioned, that dude, like, what, six four, six five? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, what about, okay, why can't you get to Joshua? What does Joshua do that stops you from getting to him? I think Joshua moves too well. Mm. He's moved too well. Got a lot of great lateral head movement. He's big. He's strong. Um, and uh, he got a great job. Is getting to him? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to get to him. Got to get to him, man. You got to get to these these yeah. these six foot six, six foot nine yeah. guys. Um, okay, so good explanation, good breakdown. Uh, let's get to let's finish this thing off with some of these questions right here. Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Whitewood, nice interview. Great, nice interview. Great guest to have on. Yeah, the boxing banker. That was your nickname, the boxing banker. Why do they call you the boxing banker? Because when I first graduated from college, I worked at Bank of America, and when I made the Olympics, uh, they became an Olympic sponsor of mine, and they used me in a USA Today advertisement, and they referred to me as the boxing banker, and, it, and that's what stuck. Okay, okay. That's a good nickname to have. What's, this is from Kieran. That was from Heinrich Smith. This is from Kieran Betts. What's up, Rafi? Um, fantastic guest picking up steam now brother much appreciated much appreciated fantastic guest indeed um <laughs> how much did you eat as an active boxer 
know. Well, I, as an active boxer, uh, when, when I was in training, I had at least three meals a day and maybe like, uh, you know, I have, let me see, three or four, about four meals a day and two shakes. Mm -hmm. So, four or six. Mm -hmm. They were very mm -hmm. nutritious meals. They were non-fat meals. No nutritious meals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, that's from the Equalizer. Good interview. What does Calvin think of the glove gate drama? What do you think of all this talk about Tyson Fury's gloves? Or you're probably too much of a busy man to even notice there's a controversy. People saying there's something wrong with his gloves. He had, he had, he had uh, some solid, solid object in his in one of his gloves. The one of them was loose. One of them was around. He had his fist in the wrist. There's 101 different excuses coming out from certain quarters of the media. Uh, talking about uh, there was something wrong with the gloves. That's the first I heard. I, I, like I said, I'm too busy to keep up. But I can tell you this, man. Uh, the 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 uh, commission right there in your dressing room, they cross-examine you watch you get your hands wrapped. You know, yeah. The dressing room cross-examine cross you getting your hands wrapped. And the commission right there to see you put your hands in the glove. Mm -hmm. I don't see how you could get, get past with you know, fixing his gloves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Heinrich Schmitz asked just out of curiosity, but how much did you bench press? Most I ever bench press in my life was 305. 305. How many plates is that? Uh, that's three on each side. Three on each side. That's very respectable. That was uh, one one press, man. I mean, boxers yeah. aren't weightlifters. Mm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, we've already asked what he thinks about Dillian White. Um, can you still remember every single fight? Says Heinrich Schmitz. Uh, I can remember every single boxing match if I'm looking at the box rack. I don't off the top of my head, right? So right, right. Box rack, I can remember every single match. I got you, I got you, I got you. Um, all right. One of the best shows so far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the Reverend Pickles is in the bill, Din. Um, yeah, stay away from narcotics, absolutely. Um, who else we got? Who else we got? Calvin, that's a good question from Marla. Calvin, have you ever thought about training fighters? I I'd imagine your schedule wouldn't allow for that right now. Man, with two young kids, I can't do it, man. I have an 11 year old and a six year old. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I do want to train boxers one day when my kids get older. Right. You know, get right. back to the, you know, the amateurs and, and the pros, get back on the scene. But, you know, it's a time for everything. Time for everything, 100%. 100%. Um, uh, where are we? Where are we? Reverend Pickle says, how you been doing on lockdown, sir? What's changed in your life in these times? Um, it's a lot of questions. So how you doing in lockdown? Lockdown is fine. I mean, you know, I, you know, wife and kids are here. You know, it's not no rush in the morning. You're already here. Mm, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the, it hasn't been too bad. It's been rather restful. I mean, you know, I mean, you know peaceful and restful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's been interesting. It's, it's been a, interesting. It's been an interesting time. Not necessarily bad, so long as you're, you're healthy, so long as you stay healthy. Yeah. But Calvin, say one. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Calvin, it's been great having you on. It's been fantastic that you take the time out of your day at short notice as well. A short notice to come and spend some time over here at Raphael Dawkins Combat Radio, talking to the Combat Radio crew, just sharing your story. It's just good to hear, have people on to share their story. Yeah, thanks, Rafi. I really appreciate you thinking so much of me and following my career and keeping up with me and having me on your show. Hey, totally, 100%. Uh, it's, it's good, to, it's good to, to take time out of the day to salute to salute those uh, those guys who have, have tried that rough, rough and rocky path. And um, also, you know, it's good to see people come out of it and and rise again, just rise as individuals, as people, um, because it's rough. It can be brutal. 
and it is not always very forgiving. So it's just good to see you. It's good to see you just just living well. We're glad. We're glad. We're glad. We're glad. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's 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 all, folks. <laughs> that's all, folks. Um, that was Calvin Brock. <laughs> that was Calvin Brock. Brock, not Brook. Brock. Yeah. Calvin Brock uh, from over there in North Carolina. The North Carolinas. Is it hillies? Is there lots of hills in North Carolina? Uh, we, there are mountains in North Carolina, but we aren't in the mountains. We are in a, like in a, uh, Charlotte. Charlotte's look more like a plateau area. Hold on. That's, that's higher altitude. You live at high altitude. I'm not near the mountains. Um, I don't oh. know what the altitude is, uh, but I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte, North Carolina. But didn't you have the first? Didn't you have the first UFC there? The first UFC ever UFC was in Charlotte. No, I'm telling you, the first it maybe, maybe it, was, I don't know. it was Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and in Charlotte, that's that's not the mountains, but it's still higher altitude than normal. Because I remember they talked about it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, we just uh. We drive about an hour and fifteen minutes. You in the mountains? Damn, damn, damn. That's 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 pretty much high altitude over there. Yeah. Um, and so, what are we saying here? What do we have here? Um, great chat, Rafi and Calvin. Absolute more, absolute more. Uh, top man, thank you for your time, sir. And I think that's the most fitting. That's the most fitting statement. We're going to leave it on. Stick around, Calvin. Stick around. Uh, thank you to the Combat Radio crew for coming through. Um, I don't remember receiving a notification, but uh, people can catch this on replay anyway. And um, I'll probably make a copy of this because the live show, it takes around two hours. Well, no, it takes hours now. It takes hours now for YouTube to process some of these live shows. So I might just make a copy of this and uh, boom have it up immediately so that people don't have to wait 12 hours to catch the replay. Um, okay. And so thank you to everyone. Thank you to Calvin Brock for coming over and spending. Let me, let me bring up my thumbnail. Let's show them the artwork. Let's show them the artwork um, for coming over, taking time uh, to spend with us over here at Raphael Dawkins Combat Radio. And thank you very much, Calvin. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to the people uh, in closing? Hey, fans, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your fanship. 100%. Couldn't have put it better for myself. Yeah, couldn't have put it better for my, the, my, the, couldn't put it better myself. Well, actually, that's a fallacy. Um, Reverend Pickles, high altitude, good to train. Well, actually, no, I contradict that. Um, it's best to train at low altitude, but sleep at high altitude. So that way you get the best of both worlds. If you try to train at high altitude, you're just not going to perform properly. Train at low altitude, and they say train low and sleep high. That's for the best results. And with that, um, the only thing left for me to say. Oh, we got a few more people filtering in. Thanks for filtering in. Um, who else has just dropped in? The D bro. Um, big up, good show. Awesome. Awesome. And so, as we say, it's the like, it's the subscribe, it's the comments, it's the shares. And it is the hitting that bell icon to stay updated with news and notifications. And don't forget about the live shows, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and the interview shows are on Thursdays. So there's lots of content out there. Feel free. Go into the catalog. Check them out. Smash the like. Smash the shares. And uh, the only thing left for me to say is blessed. 